Um, welcome to the second talk in our, diver our biology diversity series. I'm um, pleased to welcome our speaker today. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a few little um, notes for how this is going to work. First of all, this uh, webinar is being recorded. And also, if you want to ask questions, we'll have a lot of time at the end for questioning. Um, please raise your hands um, if you would like to speak. Or if you have a question, you can just enter it into the chat window, too. Um, OK, I think that's it for housekeeping. Now, um, oh, I just want to mention that we're all meeting today on Silic Okanagan Nation territory, except for our speaker, who is joining us from South Africa, where it is now 9 PM at night for her. Um, Dr. Knox Makunga is a medicinal plants biologist. She did her PhD at the University of KwaZulu-Natal and then followed by a Fulbright Fellowship at the University of Minnesota. She is currently at Stellenbosch University where she is a professor of biotechnology. And today she's going to be telling us about all the, the um, exquisite plants that are found in South Africa or looking at the medicinal treasures in the plants of South Africa. And I will turn it over to Dr. Makanga. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miranda, for this uh, wonderful introduction. And I'd like to thank Kat for organizing me to be here this evening, morning. And um, I really look forward to participating in the Q&A afterwards. And it was really lovely also to realize that Jorg is here. He's visited South Africa before, and he and I actually have a project that's now going. So it's lovely to have him here as well. And lovely to, to meet everybody virtually. I'm going to delve into the wonderful plants of South Africa. And then after that, um, I go into some people plant aspects. And then ultimately I walk you into my laboratories and give you a little bit of a taste of what we do in my labs. And then I will also be sharing some plants live as we go along. And towards the end, um, perhaps before the Q&A, I can represent these plants again, and we can possibly take it into, um, you know, out of the presentation view so you can see the plants better. So without much else, I'd like to delve right into it. If you are one of those people that loves to live tweet, please go for it. If you like to in, in Instagram, you're more than welcome to share this on Instagram as well. I've recently started a TikTok account. I'm still in learning about that, but I have a TikTok account. And if you wanna find me online, feel free to follow me and interact with me. And I will probably find you as well if you, um, mention at Knox the lion. And then if you, it, on Instagram, if you, may, if you tag me as Knox underscore Makunga, I'll be able to find that social interaction well, as well. So please go for it if you feel comfortable doing it. And I look forward to meeting you on those different social media platforms. So I'm going to um, get right into it and and take you on, on, on a visitation of the global diversity that is actually found throughout the whole entire world. And it's not equally distributed. South Africa is amongst the most mega biodiverse countries in the world. And right down there at the tip of Africa, you have iconic species such as Protea sinoroides or the king Protea, which happens to be South Africa's national flower. And the family Proteaceae is one of these iconic um, groups that actually belongs to a vegetation type that's known as the Fane boss. And that's a, an Afrikaans word. And Afrikaans is partly derived from Dutch and it means fine bush. So the Proteas and the Restionaceae and the Ericaceae, the Ericas, are amongst these groups that have really diversified and exploded in the southern tip of Africa. And 
This part of the world has three different biodiversity hotspots. This would be the Cape Floristic region. It would be the succulent Karoo. And then on the eastern side of South Africa, you have what is known as the Maputa Ponderland Albany Corridor. And it, these three biodiversity hotspots have got unique species. They are species rich. And at the same time, that biodiversity is under some kind of threat, whether it be climate change, the expansion of urban areas, and even invasion of organisms from other parts of the world. So that's the biodiversity that's, that's found in South Africa that's characteristic of the South African region. And I just wanna show you where these places are. So here in orange would be the Maputo Ponderland Albany Corridor. And sometimes I call this the MPA because that's a bit of a tongue twister. And play, uh, species such as the coral tree, the African wild ginger are some of the plants that are found in these areas. And this actually sits on the eastern side of South Africa and along here is the coast that's actually known as the Indian um, Ocean. And plants such as the African wild ginger are very much important as medicinal products. And this in itself has actually led to an extinction threat. And these plants are very difficult to find in the wild. And now cultivation has actually saved that particular species. And then if we move from that part and travel all the way down into the semi-arid areas, you actually meet up with the two other biodiversity hotspots. And here in sort of this light yellow, you have the semi-arid areas, you have the um, succulent Karoo biome, which has species such as Hoodia godonia. That particular species is actually pollinated by flies. So it gets pretty stinky when this plant is actually in, in flower. And this particular species has a very long tradition of use by people as an appetite suppressant. And at some stage, it was said that this was going to be the one plant that was going to get the whole entire world nice and skinny. Um, but that project had, was quite controversial and it ended up not um, actually being commercialized in that particular way. And then plants such as the quiver tree are also very characteristic of these semi-arid areas, the vilvichias that actually sit on on the west coast where the Benguela current splashes against the land and that particular um, part of the world actually has cold waters and that is the Atlantic Ocean that actually comes crashing on the western side of South Africa. And right down at the very tip, you actually have the meeting of these two different um, oceans and they create very interesting climates. And that part of the world is actually having a Mediterranean kind of climate. So let's walk into, or let's get into the city of Cape Town, one of the prettiest cities in the world. And this is a city that is actually built around Table Mountain. And Table Mountain stretches all the way down, uh, right to, to the tip, to the Cape Point. And the city is actually built around Table Mountain. And what's really interesting is that Table Mountain has more biodiversity, different types of plant species than the whole entire United Kingdom. And plants such as the dyesers are pretty much going into flower now. And these orchids are often found at Table Mountain and they're very, very special that they even became the emblem of the South African rugby team. And this biodiversity is somehow associated with different landscapes and different ecological environments. And South Africa, and particularly down in the southern tip, 
where you have Cape Town City, we are living in an area that's environmentally heterogeneous. And the species diversity has really been um, fascinating for natural historians and plant scientists. And many have wondered how this kind of biodiversity ended up being in this part of the world. And there are several different theories that you have recent radiations of this flora, as well as ancient radiations that are hypothesized to have led to the species richness found in the Cape region. And if you move away from the, the, the Cape area where Table Mountain is and where the city of Cape Town is and you travel inland, you ultimately get to some of the driest parts of South Africa, the Tangwa Karoo, and often these areas don't actually get any uh, rainfall for many periods of the year, but once the rains come, they explode into floral booms. And here I've just shown some of the plants that actually come to life during that time. So the phenological patterns that are associated with these plants are showing great adaptations to the environments that are actually found here. At the same time, the southern tip of Africa is a fire prone environment and the fire regimes are very much part of the ecological environments that control the germination of these plants as well as the dispersal of seeds. So species such as the proteus, for example, are actually dependent on fire for their um, opening up allowing for those seeds to actually be dispersed. And then also once the rains come, the carrikins that are actually found in the smoke will elicit germination. And in some parts of South Africa, you even have times when there's actually snow. And this is a picture of an area that's known as Hoxback. And Hoxback was thought to be one of those areas that actually inspired J.R.R. Tolkien to write The Hobbit. And then he followed, up, followed that up with Lord of the Rings. And the flora there is also very much special. And in June, July, you have times when Hoxback is covered in snow. And plants such as the Moraes, shown there, the Streptococcus over there, are all ecologically adapted to these very changing environments. The Feinbos itself is very much a, a shrubby woodland and it is also dependent on some of the snowfall in, on the mountains because this provides a source of water and all of these different climatic conditions are also thought to have led to this very diverse, diverse flora. So the Cape has really um, nutrient poor soils because the soils are very ancient. And this has led to adaptations such as cluster roots, proteas uh, form these cluster roots and these cluster roots allow for acquisition of minerals, particularly uh, nitrates and phosphates. And all of these different adaptations, whether they be ecological, uh, environmental, um, linked to nutrient acquisition strategies are a suite of adaptations that have thought to have led to the species richness and the species radiations in the area. And these areas are referred to as the Greater Cape Floristic Region and they are extremely different in the way that they look. And this has really led to an explosion of different species. And I'm just going to show a few here and just bring out a few examples. Many different species, such as Drosseras, lots of different types of sundews are found in, in the Cape. You have many different kinds of succulents in the succulent area, such as these Masonias, plants such as the Bruneas that belong to the Bruniaceae, medicinal plants, 
um, dice career that are actually exploited by people for health purposes. And even the sweetest little succulent species that are sometimes very difficult to see in the wild conophytums that are fascinating people that are actually being heavily exploited and poached for Asian markets as plant curiosities. And there are many different kinds of plants. You have bulbous species, and there I am jumping on top of some bulbs in an area called Nevoad Field during the spring, and different kinds of da daisies that bloom and blossom, and everybody goes crazy when these flowers are have exploded, and they find the areas where they're actually found because these spring blossoms come once in a while. And all kinds of different plants, watsonias that pop up after um, you've had a fire and then they really explode. And this is in Yonkers Hook. And I'm mentioning this because York has actually cycled in, in on some of these mountains. Pelagoniums that are actually found in desert areas that belong to the family Gerinaceae. South Africa has uh, given many different kinds of pelagoniums to the world as horticultural species. And these, of course, are also of medicinal value. And we have many different types of proteus. Very different species with a wildly different um, ways and strategies of actually living in the different homes that they have adapted to. And I bring up the clivias because they're really quite beautiful. They're of horticultural importance. They're also of medicinal importance, even though they contain um, alkaloids that are highly toxic. And um, these species, including this melianthus, which I think has got quite fascinating flowers because they're so dark in this burgundy, they are often used as topical treatments um, because they contain poisonous uh, medicinal um, components. And in many areas you, are, you may go to, you find that at some times of the year, it looks like nothing is really going on there and it's almost a wasteland. But then if you look very, very closely in terms of where you are going, you will find the sweetest conophytums that are actually very well adapted to the environments. And these conophytums like to be amongst the rocks. And here, they, I think they get a little bit of moisture, but all kinds of different species that are quite wonderful and uniquely adapted, including plants that show mimicry. These lithops, they look like stones. And we think that this might have uh, this is this kind of mimicry might have evolved for these plants to hide away from herbivores. Gladiolus, totally different look. And then the quiver trees that are also punctuating the semi desert areas of the Namakwa land. And these quiver trees are very important as climate indicators, they are shifting in their ranges they are becoming depleted in terms of their populations as a result of climate change. And this, of course, is not only a plant biodiversity risk, but it is also a risk to the social weavers that only nest in these particular trees. And all kinds of other species that are pretty special the ornithogalums, all kinds of different plants from the mesem family and species such as diorama. And this is a very special plant to my family. It was my father's most favorite species, which is one of the reasons I've actually put that there. So the plants are amazing, but now what about the people who actually exploit these plants for health purposes? Well, South Africa has this incredible plant, diverse, plant biodiversity, 10% of this um, in terms of glo global biodiversity, a concentration of species in the southern tip, and any place with high levels of plant biodiversity has high levels of 
socio and cultural uses of those plants by people. And South Africa is also extraordinarily diverse in its different people. And how did this bi um, biocultural diversity come about? Well, we need to go back in time. And I'm going to take you back to the time when the San and the Kwekwe people, sometimes this grouping of Aboriginal people is referred to as the Khoisan. And these were hunter gatherers in the region who traversed the, the southern tip. And then at some stage in history, the Bantu people migrated from central parts of Africa and all the way down the east coast and landed here in the southern tip. And there was a lot of knowledge sharing in terms of the plants and even languages were actually influenced by this. The language that I speak, Isikosa, has many very strong um, San um, influences, but it is also regarded as a Bantu language. It's got lots of clicks, and those clicks are actually characteristic of the San. And then in the 1500s, the first settlers, well, actually the first Europeans were traveling past here and stopping at times, I think these would be the Portuguese. And then in the 1700s, the Dutch actually came to settle in Southern Africa and, uh, not, and, and, and European settlers actually brought along with them, including the British, a slave trade. And that brought people from the East. And this has caused a genetic tapestry if I can call it that, and an influence in terms of cultural practices that actually exist in South Africa. And those cultural practices have even influenced the different indigenous knowledge systems that have led to a very unique ethnopharmacopoeia that is associated with the exploitation of medicinal plants. In some instances, there are Asian influences, Ayurvedic influences, color therapy that might even be integrated in the way in which plants are exploited in South Africa for health purposes. And that exploitation is an ancient cultural practice that connects people in modern time to their history. And this kind of cultural practice is linked to spirituality, to African traditional uh, religions, and it's really bringing people to their ancestors. And Amagricha in Kosa, who happen to be traditional um, healers, will often celebrate um, through um, painting their faces white, they take on a spiritual being whilst still being on earth. And this practice is very much very different to the practice that might be happening in the Western Cape, in Cape Town City, where you have another set of traditional her herbalists who happen to be the Bossi doctors, which is an Afrikaans word, or bush doctors, and they, exploit the fame boss and bring it into urban centers, but they also have amalgamated Rastafarian practices in the way that they exploit plants, although they are connected or most closely connected to the Khoi and the San people. And the exploitation of herbal products is really happening throughout the whole entire country. And this is exacerbated by the fact that you have fewer medically uh, formally trained doctors in comparison to traditional healers. And those plants are sold informally and this connects collectors to traders and to the healers themselves. And it serves this informal trade serves actually as an inspiration for the formal market where plants such as 
Pelagonium sedoides are extracted for their tubers, and the tubers are then utilized to generate a respiratory treatment, which is not only available in South Africa, but is actually also available in the United States and other parts of the North Americas as Umka Cold Care. And many of us might be familiar with this particular tea, rooibos tea, um, Aspilathus linearis is a species that has a very strict um, growth space and Aspilathus linearis or rooibos, some people call it red bush, is often collected in the wild or else organically grown in order for us to make all kinds of different uh, products. And this is part of the formal trade of medicinal plants in South Africa. And that uh, trade is an emerging trade and it's somehow linked to about 5,000 plants that are used for medicinal purposes by people, which are often collected in the wild. And here I've shown the bush doctors who have gone to collect plants in the wild and they denounce Western ways of doing things. Hence, they wear these um, sack clothes because this again connects them historically to their traditions. And so how has the formal trade in terms of medicinal plants actually evolved? And this is often related to ancient people such as a koi in the sand, but at the same time to, to the early travelers who went out into this strange land, um, the early settlers who then documented the plants that they were meeting and even the practices of the people at, the, at that particular time. And Simon van der Stel, who was the governor of the town where I actually live, Stellenbosch, collected plants, and um, documented the practices of the time, including a plant that I actually study, which is known as skeletium. And he, at that particular time, recognized this as a plant that had commercial um, potential because he saw the sand people celebrating, utilizing this plant, chewing on this plant, and then becoming exceedingly euphoric and he thought that this might be a species that, that could be of commercial interest. But it was only in the 1970s that the mesembrine alkaloids were actually isolated. And then in the 1990s that the first uh, pharmacological assays were conducted. And this is somehow also linked to South Africa's apartheid history because between the periods of 1960 and early 1990, the practice of traditional medicines was actually outlawed by the South African government through the Witchcraft Act of 1965. And since the emancipation and the freedom of South Africa, you then had the new government recognizing that this medicinal flora and the practices by the people could actually lead to a new bioeconomy and that in itself has led to many different studies that have now even eventually led to clinical analyses of standardized extracts of plants such as skeletium. And the medicinal plants that we have also are linked to a diverse range of chemistry, which has really been underexplored. And I, in my laboratories, actually work um, mainly at the specialized um, metabolite uh, level, but I'm also interested in the connection of central metabolism to specialized metabolism, trying to understand how these plants are responding in the field and how they might actually respond from a genetic and biochemical perspective. And so, that takes me now to introduce you to some of the plants that we use in my laboratories here at Stellenbosch University. And our approaches are really going 
from the field, we collect plants in the field, we try to understand what's actually happening at the ecological level, at the environmental level, so that we can mimic some of these uh, features um, in the way in which we cultivate these plants. And we hope to understand that we will be able to understand what's happening at the cellular level. We use a wide range of uh, approaches, metabolomic analyses. We also have been utilizing proteomic analyses and we hope to delve into the world of transcriptomics to answer some questions that have come from the research that we've been exploring. And the first plant that I want to bring up as an example would be Scelitium trotosum, which is a succulent and it happens to look like this. So I'm just going to bring this very close and I will bring up some of these plants later on. But these succulents are very soft. I think they feel very velvety if you touch them. They are called skeletium because of these leaves that senesce and dry up and they form these skeletons around these particular plants. And this particular species, as I mentioned before, has properties that are linked to alkaloids that are excellent for anxiety, as well as um, very good um, for mood lifting. And they're utilized for a range of neuropsychiatric and neuropsychological diseases. In our environment, we've been collecting plants from different plants throughout the succulent karoo. And I often tweet about these plants and they, and then we put them through some kind of metabolomics analyses. And we've also been growing them in tissue culture and trying to understand the effect of microenvironments on their metabolism. And that is some of the information that I'm about to share with you right now. So Kaylin Reddy, who's currently doing a PhD now, has been um, working in my lab for the last two years. And um, he has developed a molecular networking strategy for this particular set of plants. And we have been uh, looking at skeletium in terms of the genus itself. There's about eight different uh, recognized species. And we collected plants from the wild. And then we analyzed these through um, a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry analysis, which then uh, allowed us to be able to do some molecular networking. And at the same time, we have been trying to understand the chemical diversity from an in silico approach where we use um, particular receptors and we dock these compounds onto those receptors, especially trying to understand which of these alkaloids might actually have better binding in terms of their potential pharmacological actions. What's really interesting is that these plants are very variable. Even though morphologically they look pretty much the same, it's very difficult to find these plants in the wild. They hide themselves against little bush bushes and we don't know why they do this, but we have a few hypotheses. But once they are in flower, they can be very difficult to distinguish because they have these pale yellow flowers and they pretty much look the same. Skeletium tritosum can look very much like Skeletium strictum. And one has to be very careful when they're IDing these plants and some of the plants do have slightly different growth forms, such as Skeletium rigidum, which has a more upright um, growth form and a very characteristic set of idioblasts. These are um, bladder-like uh, uh, leaf cells that collect pockets of water. And in the sun, they start to glisten. So Skeletium rigidum, looks like it's wearing a whole bunch of Swarovski, Swarovski crystals. And that is one way in which to identify that particular species. But these plants can be very, very variable. 
even if they sit within one population. So plants that we collected from a, a semi-arid area known as the uh, area called Durist. Um, if you look at three different individuals from the same population, you have exceedingly variable chemistry in terms of skeletium tortosum. And in some instances, skeletium tortosum from another region hardly has much of this chemical diversity. And so we are quite interested in, in trying to understand what drives this chemical diversity. Is it a genetic expression? Is it because these plants might be genetically structured? Can this chemical diversity perhaps in, uh, tell us something about whether they're cryptic species within this genus? And we're trying to answer this with some genetic tools that we have now put into place. What's quite interesting is that many people have really focused on mesembrine alkaloids in terms of these particular plants and have not really been looking much for anything else. And um, through our particular um, molecular networking system, we've been able to better define some of the uropatene alkaloids in some of these different populations and different species. And we've also come to realize that there are many unknown alkaloids that have not been studied or characterized at all that are actually found in these extracts. And so how does this wide ranging chemistry potentially influence the pharmacological activity. And that brings me to some of the in silico work that we've been doing. So we've been trying to um, explore whether the mesembrine alkaloids are potentially um, differentially binding to some re receptors that we used for docking and binding differently from the skeletium A4 alkaloids and the ubertamine um, alkaloids. And what was really interesting is that the minor constituents, such as dihydroubertamine, have better binding in terms of the GABA receptor, which is associated with fear and anxiety. And some of these really minor alkaloids are actually seeming to have in silico um, better potential for depression and anxiety. And we thus think that it would be very important for the industry to perhaps explore um, extracts that are not necessarily just high on mesembrine, mesembrinone, and, and this other um, mesembrine type alkaloid. Because at the moment, all the extracts that are made from skeletium have got high levels of mesembrine and the other major mesembrine alkaloids. And we think that some of these other minor constituents have potential um, in terms of these different kinds of biological activities. And so we would like to explore this from an in vivo uh, potential. So now I wanna change tact and actually take you to an experiment where we group plants in cultivation, and then we explored the diversity along the different uh, plant parts, right from the apical tip and all the way down the stems. And this was quite an interesting project because it really highlighted that every different um, plant part of the leaf, all the different leaves are actually having variable chemistry and that mesembrine, which is the biomark uh, chemical marker that industry is looking for, is actually mainly located in the stems. We think that these plants might be manufacturing these alkaloids in the leaves and then transporting them um, via the stems and even depositing some of these alkaloids in the roots. And I say this because in traditional medicine, the way in which these plants are actually explored is that you actually uproot the whole entire uh, plant and then you use the whole entire thing. And 
What's also really become apparent is that we still have much to understand about the, bi the biochemistry and the biosynthesis of these particular uh, plants in terms of mesembrine alkaloid metabolism. And there are still many questions that are actually unknown in terms of the relationship of the different mesembrines to each other with regards to their biosynthesis. What we do know is that this metabolism is influenced by season. At different times of the year, you have varying amounts of mesembrines and that the localization of these mesembrines throughout the plant body is happening um, very differently as they grow. We've been doing some in vitro uh, work where we stress these plants utilizing um, salt stresses as well as nutrient stresses in a tissue culture system. And then we try and understand what's happening to the levels of mesembrine. And in some instances, um, different stresses definitely lower the mesembrine um, uh, concentrations, particularly mesembrine itself. This is of significance in relation to changing climates where the nutrient profile um, of, so of soils is said to change. You have periods of drought and all of those factors are likely to increase uh, salinity, salinity stress and even increase um, iron toxicity effects in plants. With this particular study, we also went into a proteome analysis. And what was quite interesting is that there were about 15 differentially expressed um, proteins that were occurring in the treated group. And many of these proteins are actually associated with uh, primary metabolic events. They control photosynthesis. They may be controlling um, production of chlorophylls and um, they definitely change. And this of course um, is a good indicator of what's actually happening in terms of the growth and development of the plants. So now I wanna move on to my second, ex second example. And here we've been studying a species that's known as Sutherlandia frutescens. This is a legume and it deposits its, um, if you can see this, it deposits its seeds inside these papery pods. And it is found in many different environments in South Africa, not only in the Western Cape, but in other parts of South Africa. And again, here we've been interested in the pharm pharmacology, but at the same time, we have also been interested in the influences of these different biomes on the metabolism and also have been conducting some nutrient stress um, studies. So this particular plant is exploited and commercialized for Sutherlandans and Sutherlandiocytes, which happen to be um, terpenoids and um, flavonoids. And many different products are actually made from this particular species. In traditional medicine, it's used for chronic fatigue, irritability, hot flushes. It's been really, really hot in the Western Cape lately with very high temperatures, sometimes in the high 30s and, and even the 40s. And so that might be something that might be needed uh, for these conditions. And at the same time, it's been commercialized for, uh, as an anti-diabetic agent. And that commercialization started in the 1990s. Much of this plant is farmed at a small scale and some of that biomass actually comes from different wild populations. So we wanted to understand what the influence of collecting plants from very many different regions, various areas might have on the kip chemotypic uh, differentiation. And what's quite interesting is that these plants can be clustered into different groupings based on where they were actually collected. And um, plants that might be coming from nearby areas such as the red uh, collections and the yellow collections 
might actually cluster within the same grouping. And what's also very interesting is that plants that are collected from these various different areas also have different pharmacological activity. In traditional medicine, this particular species has been exploited as an anti-cancer treatment to the extent that in Afrikaans, it's called kanker bos, and that is cancer bush. And it is a widely used cancer treatment. And there are many studies that have actually shown that it does have anti-cancer effects. So we thus can conclude from our data that it would be best to collect plants that actually come from the Zastron area. And that is the re those regions over there, rather than collecting plants that have actually come from Hanspai, if the idea is to utilize that extract as an anti-cancer agent. And we think that the industry should be really quite careful in choosing a chemotype for a particular uh, pharmaceutical uh, purpose. And so to move on now to the stress study that we've been doing um, with regards to Sutherlandia, we again grew plants in a tissue culture system after we developed a tissue culture system and utilized a variety of phosphate and nitrogen stresses together sometimes with some salt stress. And what's um, interesting here is that the changes that are occurring are at the amino acid level. And we think that this is of importance because this species is also used as an immune booster and it might be those amino acids that are also promoting better health. And some of the, the um, other changes that are occurring are, you know, proline might actually change and many of the, um, the sugars also change as a way in order to be able to cope with stress. And the changes in terms of sugar metabolism, as well as uh, proline are quite well understood or well known to be associated with stress in plants. And many of these changes that are occurring at the protein level are again linked to photosynthesis, glycolysis, nitrogen assimilation, the TCA cycle, and these um, um, central uh, metabolic controlling events actually do have an influence on secondary metabolism. And in this particular instance, the Sutherlandiocytes and some of the soya saponins, which are thought to have the anti-cancer effect also change. And this study actually led us to doing a really deep profiling of the Sutherlandia um, extract. And um, again, we used a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry based technique. And we have better characterized these extract extracts um, and putatively identified um, many of the different compounds that actually occur there. And many of these compounds are camphorols, flavonoils, uh, terpenes, and we think that it is these very compounds that actually have this anti-cancer effect that has been shown in this particular species. And now I move on um, to um, an, an example where we used a hairy root system and we changed um, metabolism here, utilizing taximin, uh, a signaling peptide that was um, um, isolated by Elaine Hussens at the University of Ghent. And we generated some transgenic hairy roots and also generated some Arabidopsis um, roots with this particular um, signaling peptide. And then we tried to compare to better understand what was actually happening in these systems. In Arabidopsis, this particular signaling peptide has very interesting effects in terms of the biological and the morphological development of the leaves. Whereas in, a, in Sutherlandia, there are many different influences 
that are actually occurring at the um, specialized metabolic um, level. And there are changes, particularly to the soya saponins, and not so many changes to the sutherlandiocytes, which are unique terpenes that are found in sutherlandia. My last example is an example of a species that we have been very interested in. And this particular species, I'm just going to grab two things from my desk, um, is used in that particular form. The leaves are dried. And then after the leaves are dried, one can actually make a tincture. And that's an ethanolic tincture that was actually made by one of the Rastafarian bush doctors that we work with in close collaboration. It is also often a species that might be included in a herbal mixture like this one, having all kinds of things, um, all kinds of medicinal products that have been put into that, which is supposed to actually support uh, the immune system. And here we've been really wanting to know whether the plants that are growing in the wild as different chemotypes can be cultivated and if they still express the same biochemistry. We have also been using this to better understand genetic structure that's associated with wild populations. And that is the information that I'm gonna share with you now. So this particular plant, Dodonea viscosa, is found in many different parts of the world, not only in South Africa, it's found in India, in China, in places like Kenya, and even in the Americas. And it belongs to the family Sapindaceae, and it has saponins, which are in the leaves. And if you eat it, trying a little bit here, uh, those saponins make your mouth quite soapy. And hence it is known well, it belongs to the family Sapindaceae. It has flavonoids and other phenolics, as well as diterpenes and triterpenes. And it has been exploited in Southern Africa for a very long time. And this particular project was done in collaboration with Anna Mart Engelbrecht, who's a plant physio a human physiologist. And they showed some anti-cancer activity, particularly to breast cancer and showed a variety of ap apoptotic markers that are expressed as a result of this extract. And what was really interesting is that when the mice have been inoculated with the cancer and the tumors have grown for quite a long time and they get this herbal treatment, they continue to maintain their health, they keep on growing in their weight, but then the tumors are actually reducing. And even as an aqueous extract, which is the way in which the bush doctors actually use this particular species, it continues to have anti-cancer activity. Recently, some of the work that we've been doing has shown that it also has anti-angiogenic activity and it can control um, the um, production of new uh, blood vessels. And this work was done in collaboration with Chinese, uh, a Chinese group in a zebrafish study. And so we think that with our continued collection of a body of knowledge, together with the Kate Bush doctors, we will be able to commercialize this as an adjuvant treatment that can be used along with other uh, uh, chemotherapies. And lastly, we compared these plants at different regions, plants that are found in the sea, plants that are found in Stellenbosch, and those plants that are actually found in the Cedarburg area, which is quite majestic because it's such a wonderful and strange landscape, and that is up in the Cedarburg Mountains. And we did a common garden experiment, experiment here where we actually grew plants in cultivation, and what was really interesting is that if we compare the metabolomic patterns of those plants that are wild collected and the plants that are found in cultivation, you have very similar patterns in terms of their clustering on a principal component, component analysis. And the Cedarburg populations are always grouping in their own space, whereas the Dehuop and the Stellenbosch populations 
seem to share this, um, you know, the space that is on, on this part of the PCA. And so we wanted to know if this was something that had a genetic link, was it linked to population structure? And we utilized a microsatellite analysis here. And that microsatellite work actually, again, revealed similar patterns to the metabolomic, analysis, metabolomic analyses, where the Stellenbosch populations and the, and, the, and the De Hoop populations were much more similar in terms of their genetic um, diversity in comparison to the Cedarberg populations. And when we looked at the stomatal conductance, we had exactly similar patterns where the Cedarberg populations um, were actually um, photosynthesizing and had different uh, photosynthesis and even stomatal uh, conductance uh, measurements in comparison to the Stellenbosch and De Hoop groups. So we think that there might be some mountain types, a mountain type and the coastal types, and that there is gene flow between the Stellenbosch and the De Hoop uh, populations, whereas the Cedarberg area actually acts as a genetic break because these plants are populated by ants, so they can't really travel large distances. And if, even though there is wind dispersal that might be happening, the Cedarberg mountain range actually might actually contain the, um, the, the, the genetic pool that is actually found within the Cedarberg mountain area. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the conclusions, and I hope that today that I've been able to share some interesting plants with you that are found here in South Africa and share some aspects of how those plants are utilized by people. And last but not least, how different scientific tools are helping us to get a better perspective into what might be driving the chemistry and even assist us in our commercialization of this flora, which we hope to commercialize and allow for those benefits to be shared with the various uh, communities that have held this knowledge for a very long time. And with that, I'd like to thank collaborators that have worked with me that sit in different parts of the world my students, and I thank you for your attention. And in Kosa, I say Ngosi in Afrikaans, I say Danki in English. Thank you, Siabonga in Isizulu. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Makanga. That was absolutely fabulous. I've always, always, it's my life dream to go to the Cape and see the flowers of the Cape. And oh, now I want to go even more. It was just beautiful. Um, so we're open for questions. We've got quite a bit of time. Um, if you want to raise your hand, you can speak to Dr. Makanga directly, or you can write something in the chat and I'll read it out for you. Um, I see there is one. Kat, do you have a question? I do. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the collaboration between your team and the Kate Bush Doctors Association. Um, like how does that work in the process? Oh, it's a wonderful collaboration. Um, so uh, Lennox Olifir, um, I might just go back there just to bring up his beautiful face. Um, that, that wonderful man right there is actually um, of Dutch descent. Um, so he's actually Afrikaans and he was very much interested. He's a sociologist, he was very much interested in the Cape Bush um, medicine. And as somebody that's actually adopted Rastafarian, he did a, a, um, so, a sociology based um, a masters um, where he wanted to better understand the evolution of Rastafarianism and the way that has dovetailed with the practices of the Bush doctors. And so, and I think it was quite easy for him because as a Rasta, he could 
find an entry point into that particular community of Rastafarian bush doctors. And, um, and then that was uh, early on around about 2006, 2007. And at that same time, Lisa Philander, who has a, a connection to South Africa, her, her father is a South African, but he has lived in the US for a long time and she was born in the United States. And she works at the University of Minnesota now came to South Africa to do a study on the Rastafarian bush um, medicine. And it was an ethnobotanical study, documentation of their practices and looking at the trade of these bush doctors. And I assisted Lisa with that particular research. And, um, and that led me to meet with Lennox and at the same time to meet with Cora. I'm giving this history because it often takes a long time to build and foster a relationship with a community of people that are not necessarily from the same uh, grouping as you. You have to build that particular trust. And so we then started to work together in collaboration because we realized that the bush doctors don't have access to land, that they are wanting to uh, derive economic benefits from their knowledge, but this is not really possible. So they then collected themselves um, after Lennox did the study, they collected themselves into a organization that registers as, as a nonprofit organization, which meant that they could access government funding for projects. And at the same time, we could work in collaboration with them as a recognized group of healers. And um, we then wrote a project proposal together and you have to have somebody that's an indigenous knowledge holder that's linked to the Biodiversity Act of South, South Africa um, that is embedded in the Nagoya Protocol. And then um, this then meant that they had their pool of money to drive their own projects. And then we could also drive um, scientific um, discoveries in relation to that. And that is how we built um, that, rela that relationship. And in the end, um, we are able to provide them with information about their plants that validates their indigenous knowledge. And, you know, they can bottle things and go, this has got these compounds, those are the active ingredients, and this is actually how it works. Okay, great, thank you. I've got a couple of questions. I'm gonna read one from Jonathan Davies. He asks, do you have an idea of what evolutionary or ecological processes have selected for this chemical diversity and what are the benefits to the plant? I think it's multi-dimensional. We don't know how this chemical diversity has come about. We're still just learning about it. There's about four to 5,000 plants that are used on a day-to-day -day basis in South Africa, if you look at the whole entire, in the whole entire country. But it might be linked to, um, you know, it might be linked to um, um, ecological and environmental drivers. Um, it could be linked to um, different animals that are actually found in different areas. So the skeletium, for example, is something that is loved by ungulates. Sometimes when we go out into, into the wild, we find that, you know, you've had something that's actually munched on this. So I think there may be different um, drivers in terms of this evolution um, of this chemical diversity that's associated with these plants. And at the same time, maybe also in other, in, you know, in other species where people have actually tried to understand the evolution of these different of different pathways in different species, um, there has been an idea that it might also be linked to convergent um, evolution. It's very difficult to to pinpoint what drives um, um, specialized metabolism. There have also been ideas that there are ancient 
uh, genes that might that you know that might be switched off, um, or they change the way in which they function as plants actually moved from from you know water to land that might actually have um, led to the diversification of different pathways um, that control specialized metabolism. There are many different questions that we don't have answers to. And unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, it's difficult sometimes to be able to work um, at this particular level, you know, at sort of like the genetic level to try and understand how this diversity came about because the genome reference tools for these species, including Skeletium, Sutherlandia, are currently not available. They haven't been sequenced. So it sometimes becomes very difficult um, to work with these plants because you just don't have these particular resources. Um, Tyler uh, Donner asked a question which was kind of similar, asking for biotic factors responsible for chemical diversity. But I think, I think Dr. Makanga kind of addressed that. Do you, do you think? <laughs> Do you have anything else to say about biotic um, influences on chemical diversity? I think there are many. Um, so we have been, you know, trying to, to chip away at this slowly but surely. And, you know, in this particular case, I'm bringing up Skeletium, which has become one of my favorite plants to study. And um, this particular species is, is quite strange. You know, I mentioned this, I said, it has a tendency to hide. We don't know if it's hiding from herbivores. We don't know whether it's as a result of highlight intensity environments where it's actually growing. Is it because it grows in, the, in the, these desert um, type of environments that it's getting exposed to high levels of ultraviolet light is it because the soil chemistry is different? Could it even be the soil plant microbiome that might be influencing this diversity? Um, at this stage, we really don't necessarily have the answers. Is it a combination of these different um, environments? We actually don't necessarily know. Necessarily know. Um, I think there is a, you know, there's a two-way play here the you know the genetic the genotype um, is also restricting what potential the plant can have in terms of its metabolism um, even if the conditions actually are changing but I think both um, genotypic changes as well as environmental changes uh, are kind of playing together there. Some people have even thought that it could be as a result of epigenetic changes that result in changes in the genome that then become uh, heritable. So there are many different hypotheses in terms of these abiotic um, influences. It's, it's quite interesting uh, what happens with skeletium because it also um, produces beta lanes which are red pigments that are quite restricted in plants and the beta lanes and the mesembrines actually have the same precursor. So do environmental conditions then elicit beta lanes in favor of um, mesembrines? We are not quite um, sure if what, you know, wh where the control point actually is because we are still trying to figure it out. Um, I have so many questions, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Um, Robin, would you like to answer a question? I just I wanted to ask, sure. I just wanted to ask if we could see your plant skin with the screen unshared so that we can get a better view. Sorry? The can plant, we, can we the the plant earlier. again, yes. Yeah, can I'm we gonna stop screen and see I'm going to yeah. stop screen share so that we can get into those plants. Um, it stopped? Yes, it has. Yes. Um, so um, this one is the skeletium. 
I'm just going to bring it very close. Um, they're very soft, um, but they make these, um, I'm, I'm going to break something here. Um, they make these skeletons as they, as they grow. And they have quite an interesting habit in that as they start to flower, because they're growing underneath a the bush, they start to flower, they grow out of the bush so that the bees can actually find them uh, for pollination. So that, that's quite an interesting uh, pollination mechanism that they actually have. And then I also showed um, some pressed flowers of Sutherlandia. It's a legume, it's really beautiful in the wild. They pop up. And this one is the one that I said was anti-cancerous. And then these very dry leaves of Dodonea does, really doesn't look like much, but it is an exceedingly powerful um, anti-cancer agent in terms of the work that we've actually been, been doing. And, and, and people will take a handful of leaves, they pop it in some tea, and then they drink that three times. So the bush doctors say, if you can get a cluster of leaves that are about the size of your fist, that is the right dose for your body. And those are the, those are the ones that I showed. And then I also just showed a packet of very, you know, it's, if you, if you can see there, there's probably about four or five different plant species. And one of them, I'm just grabbing it, is this thing. And it's called an African potato, <laughs> um, hypoxis. It's a tuber. And at some stage, people were actually using this as an anti-HIV treatment. OK, thank you. Um, can I ask at least one of my questions? Yes. I mean, I, I was struck throughout your talk about the vulnerability of the diversity. I mean, you have so much plant diversity and plant, I mean, it's something that I care about more than anything. Um, your work is, is it in a difficult position though, right? Because you're identifying these populations that are going to be very useful for um, pharmaceuticals. How do you balance um, protecting these natural, these wild populations for, for biodiversity sake, but also for bush doctors and their sovereignty over their livelihoods. How do you, how do you come to terms with that? So, so we, we really are trying to work in, you know, in both spaces. So we are identifying plants that are commercially important, but at the same time, we are saying that's the right chemotype that you should choose if you're going to commercialize it but don't go and now get it from the wild. So we choose that chemotype. We then, in some of our, our projects in the lab are developing tissue culture strategies in order to be able to maintain those genotypes. And then at the same time, we work together with agronomists to try and figure out how do you grow this thing that's never been grown as a crop before so that we can actually get it into a commercial space that doesn't endanger the biodiversity that actually exists there. And particularly for something like Skeletium, it, sometimes in a population you only have 10 plants. Um, so you need to be able to, to maintain that biodiversity, but we use conservation as, you know, cultivation as a conservation strategy and then we also collect plants, we get them into botanical gardens so that they can um, set up some ex situ conservation practices. And we're trying by all means to generate ways in which these plants can be cultivated. The bush doctors aren't into a monoculture, they are much more into the practice or the philosophy of growing these plants in a much more sort of biodynamic way. They say that they would be, and one of the things that we did, and actually they drove this project, they went and approached local wine farmers 
and you know the land is often in the hands of um, you know white people that are linked to you know either whether English or Dutch etc and it's not in the hands of the bush doctors so they actually approached um, some of the wine farmers that have biodynamic farms because that philosophy speaks to them and then they said we know you've got natural areas that are not planted with grapes would it be possible to do what we call botanical ranching or we kind of call this botanical ranching so you actually take plants from the wild and maybe you collect some seed in limited amounts and then you plant out the herbs that they actually want to grow in a wild setting so that they actually have access to that. And we hope that that deters wild harvesting, but at the same time is part of a production or value chain that gets those plants into commercial space. And yesterday I was actually at, um, at a meeting where we are thinking of even intercropping um, these medicinal herbs in some of the vineyards because agriculture has actually been much more destructive in South Africa in terms of the loss of biodiversity. So um, intercropping with some of these herbs, um, it chases away insects, it keeps that whole entire ecosystem much more healthy. And then at the end of the day, you can valorize both blueberries, grapes, peaches, whatever, and still get to the medicinal product. So those are some of our ideas in trying to, to, to deal with commercializing something that actually came from wild environments. That's great. I mean, that you're, you're all over the place. I mean, your research program is functioning at so many different levels. It's, it's fascinating to me. Um, but I think, I think we're out of time. If there's no last questions, I could ask about a hundred more, but I'll, I'll save you guys from that. Um, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Makanga. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. And I really appreciate you staying up late tonight <laughs> for giving it to us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And you're absolutely welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining me. I really appreciate the invite and your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the the day. And if you want to email me, feel free uh, to email and I would be happy to answer those questions. And thank you so much. And I hope to visit there um, at some stage once travel is much easier and we can all be together. Thank We're going to have to visit each other, I think. I got to get there. <laughs> thank you For so sure. much. Um, I think, and the only announcement I have is next week is probably canceled, right? Because of reading week. In two weeks is the next the next diversity seminar. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.